Hey guys, uh, today we are going to finish talking about water pollution. We're doing the second part of the notes. We should have already done the first part of the notes in class. Uh, we learned about the various um, water quality tests that you can do, such as dissolved oxygen and turbidity and those sorts of things. Um, so this first slide just kind of reviews what we've already discussed a bit with those first notes. We've already talked a little bit about the Clean Water Act. came about in 1972. Um, we'll learn a little bit more details about that at the end of these notes. And then um, I just put this stuff at the beginning of the notes just to remind you that um, you know we've already learned about these water quality tests. Um, when you go to study for this unit, you're going to want to refer back to uh, all those notes um, of those different tests, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, biochemical oxygen demand, temperature changes, those sorts of things. Um, it says from the field trip. They're, they're field trip notes, but we didn't do that field trip this year. Sorry, guys. Um, and then also, just to remember these indicator species we've talked a little bit about, we're going to revisit those again today as well. So, let's get into it. Uh, first thing we're going to start with are oxygen issues. And um, I will show you what we call an oxygen sag curve, um, which I guess we're getting a little ahead of ourselves because we haven't talked about the biochemical oxygen demand in these notes yet. Um, so actually, let me show you what this looks like. This is a, a diagram um, that shows us what happens to oxygen levels uh, right where a pollutant would be released into water. So this would be you know, a stream or a river. This would be flowing water. And what we see here is it says that this would be the point of waste or heat discharge. So here's your um, emissions, uh, your affluent coming out of some sort of factory or, you know, any source. So anyways, um, at, the, at the site of the release, what we see happen here is we've got a decent amount of dissolved oxygen available, and it says, you know, before it's released, we've got normal clean water organisms. Uh, they list some of the types of fish and uh, other organisms that you would see here. And we want to follow this orange line, and so what we see happen is after these emissions are released, uh, you go into what we call this first decomposition zone, and so you're going to see these trashy type fish. Um, that would be an indicator to us that conditions are getting kind of bad, and we're seeing the oxygen levels go down because we are um, releasing a whole bunch of this organic waste. And I'll tell you why this happens, why the oxygen goes down when we release organic waste. So we see carp, scars, and leeches here. Uh, the septic zone is probably the worst here because that's where it's starting to get really low in oxygen levels. Um, you've got a lot of this waste, which come to find out whenever we talk about organic waste in here we're talking about uh, stuff that was living that's probably now dead and decomposing so dead algae, um, poop, um, you know, dead decaying stuff and again if this is coming out of uh, a factory it could be uh, some sort of bodily waste, some sort of manure, that sort of thing. So anyways you're going to have a lot of decomposition happening, you're sucking up a lot of the oxygen out of the water, the oxygen level stays low and then we start to go into recovery zone. Here we see a lot of these guys that we saw in the decomposition zone as oxygen is still low but it's starting to come back up and then eventually, with water flow, it'll weed out that stuff. We'll get back to a clean zone, and we'll go back to uh, organisms that would indicate good quality in the water as the oxygen levels come back up. Uh, what we'll notice is that, so the orange line is dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen is good. You need to have oxygen dissolved into water for living things to survive. Um, this blue line here is the BOD, biochem biological oxygen demand. And so as the dissolved oxygen levels uh, go down and up, up, the BOD does the opposite. So um, while the oxygen levels are low here, the BOD is high, and then notice when the oxygen levels get high, the BOD level goes low, and that's going to be important for uh, our next couple slides. Okay, so let's talk about this oxygen demanding waste. Uh, I kind of mentioned this a second ago. So oxygen demanded waste, ODW, is organic matter. So again, it could be poops and manures and um, you know waste from organisms, algaes uh, that are dying and decomposing, or just dead stuff uh, that enters the body of water, um, and it's going to feed the growth and respiration and decomposition of little microbes, like little bacteria. They're going to be breaking that dead stuff down. Okay, so this biochemical oxygen demand is, is a very important concept to understand. Um, with these decomposers, with these bacteria that we just mentioned, um, they need oxygen in the water to decompose that organic waste that's building up. Okay, so if you get a lot of organic waste, again, could be 
poops and excrements, uh, algaes, dying plants, dead stuff, um, the more that you have, the more microbes and bacteria you have that are going to need to break those down. Therefore, the more oxygen you're going to need in the water for all that decomposition to take place. Um, so a low BOD would actually show healthier water um, because that means you have less microbes doing decomposition and you've got more available oxygen there. Uh, while a high reading would show that you have dirty water because you're saying that you've got a very high demand for oxygen, which means you've got dirty conditions and lots of bacteria that need to do lots of decomposition and suck up lots of oxygen out of the water. Okay, so when that BOD measure is really high, the amount of oxygen for other organisms is low because they're being sucked up by those bacteria doing decomposition, and that can be lethal to many fish. This is what we call fish kills. Um, if you've ever walked by a lake or a pond that's got all that green algae, and you see a little fish bubbling up on the top, they're just floating there, obviously they're dead. That would be a perfect example of these dead zones. Okay, so that's what we call a dead zone. It would be an area where oxygen levels get so low and little life can survive because of all that decomposition that's been occurring. Um, this can actually create our positive feedback cycles that we've been working on. Remember, positive is bad because we're moving further and further away from the norm. Um, so the way this would cycle is uh, if you have more and more death, that means you have more decomposition, which means less oxygen in the water for other living things, which means more death and more decomposition and less oxygen, and it just keeps spinning and spinning and spinning and getting worse, 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 worse. Okay, good example of a dead zone, a famous dead zone. There's an area in the Gulf of Mexico. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Um, Mississippi River runs um, through our country, and it's going to dump down into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, that river runs right through the heartland of a lot of farms. So it says it's going to receive an influx of wastewater and fertilizers um, from all that farmland that it passes through. That's going to lead to huge algal blooms down in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and I'll show you this famous dead zone. And it's estimated that there are 200 dead zones worldwide. Okay, so here's your Gulf of Mexico down here. Here's this famous, we call hypoxic zone or a dead zone. It, it's lacking in oxygen and you've got a lot of um, life forms that, you, that can die if they don't get that oxygen that they need. And here's your, if you follow your Mississippi River, here it goes all the way down through here. So imagine all the farmland that it's cutting through and all the waste that are getting dumped into it, especially stuff that's heavy in nitrogen and phosphorus, um, and not to mention fertilizers that usually have a lot of nitrogen and uh, phosphorus in them as well. Those get dumped into here, lead to algal blooms, and then that would lead to a dead zone. Okay, so what we've been talking about is a very important word for you to know. We've actually heard this word earlier in the year, but we're going to talk about it in detail today. This is called eutrophication. And the actual definition of eutrophication is uh, having an abundance of fertility to a body of water. And the two main guys involved, again, we talked about these nutrient cycles at the beginning of the year, uh, these are nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, they're limiting nutrients. You need them for plant growth, but when we get too much of them in the water, they will stimulate algae and it will cause eutrophication. Okay, so these nutrients would get added to water from excess runoff from fertilizers, uh, especially from farming and from even from yards in the suburbs. Uh, wastewater could be uh, sewage, human and animal waste. Uh, a lot of soaps and detergents have phosphates in them. Um, this eutrophication can cause rapid growth of algae, which eventually dies, causing the microbes to increase the amount of oxygen they suck out of the water, so the BOD level goes up. Um, locally, uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, we have issues with that as well. Um, we have issues with uh, wastewater and sewage being released into there. Um, you have manure from farms. We have fertilizers from farms and yards. causes lots of algal blooms in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, you've probably seen all sorts of stuff, Save the Bay, all these action plans that have taken place, and they say that, you know, because we have um, implemented a lot of these um, policies and procedures to help clean up the bay, that conditions have gotten better. Uh, the blue crab population has really made a comeback, so they say it's somewhat of a success story. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, Chesapeake Bay is actually a really good environmental case study. Okay. Now, if that eutrophication, if the dumping of excess nitrogen and phosphorus is human-caused, we call that cultural eutrophication. Uh, there is a lot of natural 
uh, nitrates and phosphates in the environment that can run off on their own. But again, there's a lot of stuff coming from anthropogenic sources. We would call that uh, cultural eutrophication. And here's just a basic picture showing you how this would happen. So here's your organic sources, again, coming from a cow. That's probably going to be his manure, his poop. Okay, so that would run off down the hill. Here we've got fertilizers that contain nitrates and phosphates. That would run off down the hill. Here's your rain causing the runoff. Um, that stuff gets released into a nearby body of water. They get dissolved into the water, and that would stimulate al algae growth. So again, here's one of these... Um, you might have seen a body of water like this with all this algae growing. That's an algal bloom. Uh, realistically, you might see some little dead fish floating along the top. And if so, you know that that is truly a hypoxic body of water. It's lacking oxygen and it uh, has killed those fish. Okay, just one more graphic that shows you all the various things that can release um, nitrates and phosphates into a body of water. So this is your lake ecosystem, and it's saying that it's had nutrient overload, um, which would be undergoing eutrophication. So you can actually get nitrogen oxides from um, combustion engines and furnaces, anything that's burning off those noxes that we've learned about in the air pollution unit that could cause uh, nitrates to make their way to the water. Um, discharge of treated municipal sewage, Again, if it's got nitrates and phosphates in it, that would um, add to the problem of eutrophication. Here we have untreated sewage being released to the water, uh, discharge of detergents, which have phosphates uh, from homes. Here you have more nitrogen-based stuff coming from cars and factories. Uh, here's your natural runoff. Like I said, nitrates and phosphates do naturally exist in the environment, so just natural runoff of those. Uh, manure is going to have a lot of those um, substances in them, so that can run off. Here you have um, just stuff from suburbia, runoff from streets, lawns, and construction lots. And lastly, you have uh, runoff from like construction areas, um, erosion, mining, that sort of thing. Okay. So what are some ways to prevent cultural eutrophication? Uh, use a better, more advanced sewage treatment. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Ban or limit phosphates in household detergents and other cleaners. Uh, a lot of detergents and soap companies have started to limit uh, the phosphates that they put in their products. And uh, practice soil conservation and land use control to reduce nutrient runoff. So all that stuff we talked about back in the soil unit about preventing erosion, preventing stuff from running off would come into play here. Diseases from water. Uh, so here it lists the various uh, waterborne diseases that exist. Um, I guess these are some of the big ones, actually. Uh, more of a problem in developing countries, but we have cholera, typhoid fever, stomach flu, diarrhea, cholera, and hepatitis. Um, here it says these plus malaria cause about 3.1 million deaths per year. Uh, they could be prevented by just providing safe drinking water to these people uh, and even just proper sanitation and proper hygiene. Um, Again, this is mostly going to be a developing country thing. Oh, you, we don't realize how many people on a daily basis, their, their goal in life is to find clean drinking water. You know, they have to walk long, long distances to a well to pump water, and it may not even be clean. Or they might just find a nearby stream that has um, manure waste and that sort of thing, but they don't have any choice. It's the only water they have to drink, and if it happens to be contaminated with something and they get it, you know, and they don't have any medicine, there's a good chance that they're going to die from it. Uh, so here it says over 1 billion people worldwide lack access to safe drinking water on a daily basis. So that's a major uh, killer of people on this planet is not being able to find clean water. Okay, so it says it's not feasible to test for uh, the, all, all of these diseases and all of these pathogens in drinking water. Um, so a better way to kind of test to see if water is clean or not of these pathogens is to use indicator species. Uh, and these are organisms that would indicate whether or not pathogens are likely to be present or not. Um, I already pointed out some of these on that oxygen sag curve, but some bad ones that we don't want to see in the water, and we're going to do this test uh, when we do our water testing. Uh, this one is fecal coliform bacteria. Um, so you test for this, and the fecal coliform bacteria is going to be bacteria that lives in intestines of humans and mammals, like E. coli. If you test your water and you find that it has this fecal coliform or this E. coli bacteria, uh, that would mean that there is intestinal waste in that water supply. 
which again depending on the level might mean that uh, you know you should not be swimming in it I've seen uh, some public natural bodies of water where it's like sorry this particular body of water is closed you're not allowed to swim in it because the bacteria levels are too high and then it definitely would mean not to consume it. Uh, another one, I got a nasty picture of these guys on the next page, uh, are rat-tailed maggots. Uh, they're exa they look exactly like they sound. They also live in stagnant, oxygen-deprived water with lots of that organic content. Um, it says it's fairly tolerant of pollution and can live in sewage lagoons and cesspools. So if you see these guys, again, that water is dirty. You do not want to drink it. Uh, some other bad guys are sludge worms and blood worms. Um, lichens, I have a worksheet that I think you guys are going to do. Lichens is usually, well, it's for air pollution. Typically, when you see lichens, that's a good thing. It means that uh, air quality is good, but you've got various types of lichens that would indicate uh, different air qualities. Okay, so here's the E. coli, the fecal coliform bacteria. Unfortunately, we don't have the plates to plate out the water. That's really, really cool. I love doing that. You streak the plate and you see the bacterial colonies grow. We have just the chemical indicator test for this. Um, and then here's that rat-tailed maggot I was talking about, which is another bad thing. You don't want to see that in the water. That would indicate bad conditions. Okay, on to sewage treatment. Uh, there are two main systems for treating sewage. Uh, one is what we call a septic system or your septic tank. That's for uh, a rural type area where you'd have your well water. And then the other one would be your sewage treatment plants and that's for city water. Uh, I've lived with both. I definitely like my city water uh, much better, but um, I grew up in Stafford with a well in a more rural area, uh, so I've been there and done that too. Um, so we'll start by talking about the septic system. Um, these receive waste from the household, like it's actually out in the yard, it's part of your home where you live. Um, and I'll show you a picture here in a second. So basically what happens is uh, you have separation of lots of different things. So your oils and greases are going to float to the top of this tank and the solids are going to float to the bottom where they undergo decomposition. And then you've got this liquidy part in the middle. So, and again, this are, these are your human waste that are coming from your house. So the liquids are going to flow through the pipes and they're going to be uh, aerated to kill pathogens. And this all happens naturally in the ground. Uh, the liquids then are taken up by the surrounding soil and the soil is going to naturally absorb and filter that liquid, uh, which would then either flow out to a nearby stream or it'll actually be taken up by the plants in your yard. Um, so I'll show you the picture in one second. And here it just says, I guess, a drawback is that so you've got this septic tank that's collecting the solid part of the, this waste, it has to be pumped out to remove the solids every five to ten years. And there's an alarm on it, and I, I remember the alarm going off when I lived with my parents, and that means, uh-oh, you need to call the septic people, and they'll send a truck out, and they'll pump out your family's solid waste that you guys have passed the past uh, five to ten years. But it is a very efficient, and it's a very natural system. Okay, so this is what it looked like. Here's your house, here's your septic tank. Um, this is what's called the leach field. So I'm just going to read a little description of what happens one more time. So the septic liquid would move out of the septic tank. So again, this is going to capture all the junk that comes out of your toilets. Um, so the liquid's going to move out of the septic tank by gravity into these pipes. Um, and then the water is going to slowly seep out into this leach field, which is your yard, uh, where it is filtered and absorbed by the surrounding soil. And again, it would either be up taken up by plants or it would flow out uh, through groundwater out to a nearby uh, water source. Okay, so now the sewage treatment plants that are used for city water, um, one of the most important things you learn about this, because there's lots and lots of steps, but one of the most important things I want you to get, get out of this is the primary treatment. Um, and I'll show you a picture uh, from your book that's really good um, showing you all these different steps. But for the primary treatment, that is where you're screening out your debris, your solids. So again, it could be sticks, stones, rags. Just think of any solids that would go down your toilet. Okay, so those are all going to go to the uh, treatment center. All the solid stuff gets filtered out um, first. Okay, so it says these suspended solids are going to settle out uh, as sludge in a settling tank. And let me actually go to. I'm going to go to this picture, and then we'll come back and explain it. Okay, so. The first thing that actually happens in this picture is they're showing your homes in suburbia, okay, and you've got pipes underground that are going to carry your solid waste away from your homes to the treatment facility. 
And so what I was just saying is the first thing that happens once it gets to the facility is it goes through this primary treatment. Primary treatment is where the large debris gets filtered out. Okay, it gets filtered out by screens. Um, anything that was solid, I'm skipping over a step for now, anything that was solid uh, becomes this sludge. It's going to settle the bottom of the tank and it's going to go um, to this sludge storage site and we'll talk about what happens to the sludge in a moment. Okay, so I'm going to move on to secondary treatment, and then I'll go back and read the slides for this. Uh, once you get into secondary treatment, uh, here you're going to have bacteria break down organic material, so any so sort of organic stuff that's left over. It's going to break it down to CO2 and inorganic nutrients, and there, any leftover uh, particles are going to settle here, and they're going to be added to the sludge. Okay, so secondary is here. Um, you're just using bacteria. Okay, so that's probably one of the most important things you know about secondary. Secondary uses bacteria, so doing biological breakdown. And then again, we're collecting all this solid stuff in sludge and it'll be stored here. Okay, and so let's talk about that sludge real quick. It says uh, we can then thicken the sludge even more by removing water. This is your waste. This is stuff that we just removed from the water, but we can uh, make it super, super solid by dehydrating it even more. And then there's a couple of different fates for that sludge. Kind of gross to think about what happens to all of our solid waste. Uh, they can either go to the landfill to be buried. Uh, they can be incinerated. They can be burned. Or they can be used as fertilizer. Okay, um, so we've done primary and secondary. Primary screening out the solids, secondary using bacteria to break down stuff. Uh, then you can go into these advanced treatments where you're really cleaning the water. Um, even better, you could use UV lights, um, you can use chemicals, what have you. We want to get any last remaining pathogens out of there. And then lastly, you would release the treated water uh, into a nearby body of water. Okay, so that's what happens to your waste. So let's go back and look at secondary treatment. Okay, so we already said secondary treatment is where the biological process occurs with bacteria. The bacteria are going to remove uh, most of that organic waste. And so here it shows they can do that with these trickling filters. Uh, it says aerobic bacteria degrade sewage as it seeps through a bed of crushed stones covered with bacteria and protozoa. And then this is talking about what's going to happen with the sludge. We said the sludge, you're going to um, let that all collect together, um, add any particulates from the secondary stuff to the sludge. And I'm going to skip over this for now. And then it says the sludge from both the primary and secondary treatment can be broken down a little bit more, dried out a little bit more, and then either incinerated, dumped into the ocean, ah, dumped into a landfill, composted, or used as fertilizer. Okay, so that's the various ways we use the sludge. Now, uh, I skipped over this, and so it says after secondary treatment with the bacteria, um, the rest of that water, the effluent from that, is then disinfected with chlorine, ozone, or UV light to remove any remaining bacteria, and then it's released into nearby waterways, or it says sometimes this water is sent to homes for stuff like watering yards. Okay. And we've already looked at a better picture than that. And then this slide is just about you know, kind of like, I guess you could call this a tertiary treatment. This is your advanced. This is going past the primary and secondary. Uh, so it says with advanced, you can actually then have another treatment that would remove any excess nitrates and phosphates, which could potentially cause more eutrophication in the body of water that's released into. So that's good. However, if you have a treatment plant that does the advanced processing, it says it cost twice as much to build and four times as much to operate. Um, and it says it, it can do this by bleaching and disinfecting uh, by chlorine. Okay, and then this is just talking about sludge again, which we've already gone over. Okay, so then once you have treated water and you've got these reservoirs, um, how does it then get treated before it comes to our home as what we call potable water or drinking water, water that you drink and bathe in in your homes. Um, this is managed, oops, this is managed by um, legislation called Safe Drinking Water Act. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about this too. Uh, EPA Environmental Protection Agency sets maximum contaminant levels for 90 different pollutants in drinking water. 
Um, and so it says one of the first things that we do to make sure the water is clean is we can clarify it by adding coagulants. Those are chemicals that will cause dirt particles to stick together. That's what coagulate means. It's going to cause them to all stick together and sink down. Um, and then it's going to pass through another filter to remove any lingering disease organisms and it would be infected or sorry disinfected with chlorine, UV light or ozone again. And uh, I think they still, I know they do this they did this when I was younger. Um, they added fluoride for our teeth to help strengthen our teeth. Um, I'm not sure if they still do that or not. Okay, and then this is just a little slide on bottled water. So uh, there is this International Bottled Water Association that's supposed to test for 181 contaminants. Okay, and then this is talking about the same thing that they're um, requiring them to test for uh, 200 chemical and biological contaminants. However, the EPA does not test or approve water, wa water filtering devices. Um, come to find out, uh, one-fourth of bottled water ends up being tap water. I've heard figures that are even larger than that as well. Um, I guess they've done tests in the past and they found that 40% um, are contaminated by bacteria and fungi. Um, to, and just so you know, even with like drinking water at your homes, drinking water with um, bottled water, there is a certain amount of bacteria that exists in them. They do have to meet a certain, uh, they have to be below a certain maximum level, but you still, it's not like it's sterile water. It's going to have bacteria in it. Uh, with bottled waters, they say that there's 1.5 million tons of plastic thrown away each year just from bottled water. Um, and the oil that's used to make plastic would power 100,000 cars for a year. Um, so the take home from this is Americans, and I have a video clip to show you guys too, but we, uh, not just Americans, everybody, we shouldn't be using these disposable plastic water bottles. We should be using reusable uh, devices. I see a lot of you guys in class that use them, which is great. If you are using disposable water bottles, make sure that you recycle them. Make sure you don't leave any water in the water bottle when you recycle it. That should be dumped out, um, and we'll talk more about that with our next set of notes. Okay, other water pollutants, so we have heavy metals like lead and arsenic. Uh, lead, we've talked about this in other chapters before, so in terms of water, it's a problem with old pipes and old homes. Uh, it says legislation now requires lead-free pipes, uh, pipe fittings, and pipe solders. Uh, we know what lead can do. It can affect your brain. It can affect the central nervous system, and it can uh, even cause kidney damages to fetuses and infants. Arsenic is a naturally occurring substance that occurs naturally in Earth's crust. It can dissolve into water. Uh, it can also be introduced through anthropogenic stuff like mining and pollution um, from industry. And it can cause various types of cancer if it gets into the drinking water. And this is a worldwide problem. So this is something that needs to be tested for. Uh, here's a map showing you where arsenic levels are highest. It's going to be anywhere where this purple, dark purple is. So we've got some out west here in um, California and Nevada and we don't really have too many over here. We're in like the lower spectrum. We're in like this um, one microgram per liter spectrum. So it looks like we're okay, but there are several places around our country where we see that dark purple. Okay, mercury, again, we've heard about this a couple times this year. Most of it comes from burning coal. However, it can come from incineration of garbage, hazardous waste, medical and dental supplies. Uh, if mercury gets converted into the methyl mercury, that's when it can start bioaccumulated in the uh, food chains, and this can also damage, cause damage to central nervous system, impair coordination, etc. Uh, humans are mostly exposed through eating fish, which the mercury exists in the water. It then bioaccumulates at low levels of a food chain and works its way up to the larger fish, like things like tuna and that sort of thing. Um, so this is just an interesting fact from your textbook. It says, in 2008, a New York Times reporter uh, went around and ate a bunch of sushi and fish from uh, different restaurants, and it says that... Um, well, he measured the mercury levels in nearby restaurants and found that a diet of six pieces of sushi per week exceeded EPA standards. Yikes. So, um, and I've actually heard of people getting mercury poisoning from eating too much fish. Okay, synthetic compounds. Ooh, this is scary stuff. Uh, pesticides. Uh, 
bad thing about them, when they get washed into water, they can kill more than just the intended organism. Uh, so if they get washed into water, they can kill things like amphibians. Uh, some effects of pesticides are still unknown. We'll talk more about them when we get to farming. Uh, one scary thing is that some pesticides can actually mimic hormones like estrogen, which brings me to the next thing. What's wrong with hormones like estrogen and even other pharmaceuticals like medicines? Um, antibiotics, hormones, steroids, they've all been found in our waters at low levels. And the really scary one for me at this point are hormones. Um, they can be scary because they can operate at very low levels, meaning that they can cause effects at even low levels. Um, and again, this is something local, and I've heard about this happening in several different places. But in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, they found far some uh, pharmaceuticals that are mimicking estrogen and causing male fish to grow female eggs in their testes. They're calling this chemical castration. Basically, these male fish are, they're seeing their male parts shrink and they're seeing eggs and female uh, characteristics develop in these males, which is completely scary. Um, other effects are unknown. We're wondering, is this having an effect on humans? Is having the hormone-like substances and, and true hormones like estrogen in the water, um, how is that affecting humans? The, I've read several studies that are trying to link it to cancers, like prostate cancers and breast cancers. Um, so where does that estrogen come from? It says that there's some pharmaceuticals that mimic estrogen, but they've actually found um, estrogen from birth control medicine, which they say gets passed through your body when you urinate, and then it becomes uh, part of the water, and then some people actually flush their pharmaceuticals um, down the toilet as well, supposedly. So anyways, we've got all these chemicals floating around in the water and um, aren't being removed, so that's, that's kind of a scary thing. These chemicals are all around us. Okay, some compounds that are coming from industries. These are long words that are hard to pronounce. So PCBs are polychlorinated biphenyls. Um, they were used in manufacturing plastics and electronics until 1979. They're no longer manufactured or used in the U.S. Uh, ingesting them can be lethal uh, and also carcinogenic, which means cancer-causing. Uh, they're very persistent and they stay in the environment for a while, but as we said, we don't use those in the U.S. anymore. Uh, PBDEs are stand for polybrominated diphenyl ethers, um, most commonly known as flame retardants in many items. Uh, these have been detected in unusual places recently. They found them in fish tissue, bird tissue, breast milk. Uh, exposure is thought to lead to brain damage, and uh, the European Union and several states have banned its manufacture. Okay, oil pollution. Uh, we should be familiar with the one that happened in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010 uh, from BP. And then also the oil can be spilled from oil tankers. We had the Exxon Valdez that ran aground in Alaska in 1989. Oil is highly toxic to um, living things. So it's toxic to the birds that live in and around the water, mammals, fish, algaes. And remember, algaes and phytoplankton serve as the base to the entire food chain. So anything that affects them is going to affect the, the whole rest of the food web. Uh, this is a persistent substance. It's got lots of different things that can happen to it. It can sink below water in these plumes. Uh, it can spread across the surface. It can move onto shorelines, and it can be very difficult to remove. Um, and it says for most of these spills, cleanup efforts persist for decades. And then afterwards, you, we discover that thousands of fish, seabirds, sea otters, and seals and whales are found dead from the oil spill. Um, so talking about that Alaskan one, it says the Alaskan ecosystem has somewhat rebounded from that particular oil spill, except for killer whale and seal populations. Um, let's see. Some of the ones that have rebounded pretty good are the bald eagle and uh, salmon. They've done pretty well. And oil expected is, is expected to remain for at least another 100 years just from that particular oil spill. Uh, now, rules have changed for ships carrying um, oil as cargo. It says that they must now have a double steel wall to contain oil in case of leaks. Okay, so what's the remediation that we do after an oil spill? Uh, we have to clean animals by hand. Um, what oil actually does to the animals, it 
reduces the ability of feathers to insulate for birds, and it also stings their skin. It's toxic to their bodies. It's heavy. It weighs them down. So we, we've all seen those commercials with the birds that are covered in oil. Uh, they have to be cleaned by hand with soap and water. And as I just mentioned, oil can either float on top of the surface water or it can form these underwater plumes. To remediate floating oil, they can do several things. Uh, they, can find, oops, they can find a way to contain it and vacuum it up, or they can use these dispersant chemicals which cause the oil to break up and kind of disperse through the water, but it says these dis dispersants can actually be toxic chemicals. Um, they can use specially designed bacteria that actually go out and digest and break down the oil. Uh, as you guys might remember from the BP oil spill, remember they were collecting a bunch of hair and they were making these weird like hair mats and they were sopping up the oil with the hair, which is kind of bizarre, but it, it seemed to work okay. Uh, for those plumes that c form these um, below surface uh, aggregates of oil, there's really no good method for removing them. So they say that there's probably tons of those remaining from oil spills we've already had. Okay, and then on to solid water pollution. So obviously we've all seen pictures and videos of immense garbage that's dumped into our water. Sometimes it's directly dumped into the water. Sometimes it comes from runoff from landfills or just uh, from not even from a landfill, just from runoff from trash on, on land. Uh, this is a famous, famous um, garbage patch. It's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch uh, out in the Pacific Ocean, obviously. Uh, I have a video clip to show you guys. It's a huge patch of mostly plastic that circulates. It looks like this big um, drain just spinning around and around and around, and it's got all this plastic. Uh, it's the size of the state of Texas. It's enormous, so I will definitely show you guys that. It's very disturbing. It'll make you never want to use plastic and throw it away again. Um, Solid water pollution trash is dangerous to animals and humans. Uh, we've all seen the uh, commercials and warnings about throwing away your plastic beverage rings. They can get caught on animals, especially when they're little before they've grown. Um, medical waste like needles obviously are harmful to um, all of us, animals and um, people included. Uh, still a problem in some developing countries. I'll show you a gross picture on the next slide. And then sediment pollution is another type of solid water pollution. That's mostly caused from construction and removal of vegetation um, that would increase erosion. Waterways can become brown and cloudy due to lots and lots of suspended particles. And then this can actually get into organisms and clog up their gills. So here is a picture of a trash problem. That is a river in Indonesia polluted with trash. That's pretty nasty. And then here's that sediment problem that we've been talking about. That is the Santa Ana River in California. It dumps tons of sediment into the Pacific Ocean. Okay, so nearing the end, our legislation here, um, we've already talked a little bit about the Clean Water Act that came about in 1972, and this first little note just says that water quality in the U.S. was generally bad until the 60s, until we started um, developing this legislation. So the Clean Water Act um, supports protection, propagation of fish, self shellfish, wildlife, and recreation in, in and on the water. Um, and it does this by... <clears throat> maintaining the chemical, physical, biological properties of natural waters. One of the most important things that it does is it issues water quality standards and it creates acceptable limits for various pollutants. So again, we're going to be keeping track of uh, pollution levels in the water, measuring them um, consistently and making sure that they fall below those levels. And if not, we um, have to uh, figure out what the problem is and fix that. And then it says it also allows EPA and states to determine how much pollution industries can discharge. So uh, they have been able to enact um, emission standards on industries. Okay, here's your Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, this act sets national standards for safe drinking water. I put, wow, really? Yeah, no duh. Uh, EPA establishes maximum contaminant levels, those are called MCLs, for 77 substances in both surface and groundwaters. Uh, it says it's great for improving conditions from point source pollution, like factories and wastewater plants, where they can directly say, you guys cannot release any more pollutants um, than this particular level but it's not so good for non-point sources like parking lots, lawns, farms, that sort of thing. Um, that's where we have a, a difficult time with the non-point source. 
And here it says, for many developing countries, they are focused on industrializing and not the environmental issues, so they don't really have that many great water regulations in place. Also, many factories from developed countries like ours move to developing countries, so the pollution goes with them, so the developing countries end up getting a lot of our uh, pollution from, from U.S. developed industries. Okay, and the last couple slides talk about ways to reduce uh, non-point source pollution. We said this is kind of difficult to deal with. Uh, here it says leading cause of non-point source would be agriculture. And so what farmers can do is uh, they can reduce fertilizer runoff um, by reducing or eliminating the amount of fertilizer they use, using slow-release fertilizers, using alternate crops between rows, um, and doing nitrogen fixation crops. Uh, planting buffer zones between fields and nearby surfaces of water. So just, again, practicing common sense ways to reduce erosion. Uh, apply pesticides only when needed and use biological control for pests. We're going to talk about how that works with farming. Okay, some other things. Uh, eliminate or reduce inorganic fertilizers and pesticides for golf courses, lawns, and public lands. Uh, livestock growers could manage their animal density a little bit better. Uh, less livestock, meaning uh, less manure. Okay, again, planting those buffer zones that would prevent erosion uh, and better location of feedlots so uh, manure wouldn't run off. Creating detention basins for animal runoff and reapply fertilizers to croplands uh, or forest lands and reforest critical watersheds uh, that would reduce erosion and the severity of flooding and it would slow global warming and the loss of wildlife habitats. Okay, so that is it for these notes, I believe, and your next notes are going to be on water resources. Thank you. See you later.